on the one hand climate change and on the other hand poor planning and poor policy because there is one thing that the government can do straight away which is reduce prices or of petrol and diesel if they did that and that's in the hands of the government because it could just reduce the taxes that it is collecting it is causing general inflation and it is causing food inflation in particular because food in a large country like ours has to be transported and transport costs are factored in to the final price because we are still a very poor country we may pretend otherwise so what if we are the fifth largest economy in the world we are also have the largest population of the world our per capita income makes us the poorest country among the g20 because we we are muddling through every problem we will continue to muddle through at least for the next year un, unless and until we get a change of government because this government has shown no vision at all we will continue to muddle through at least for the next year un, unless and until we get a change of government because this government has shown no vision at all it has brought us to this crisis it's i think what i've demonstrated in this interview to you is the very poor economic policy management and the very poor understanding of the of the climate change issue and how it's affecting uh, our entire economy hello and welcome to farm talks as the g20 nations meet in new delhi to discuss world affairs and potentially a new economic cooperation for the future india is battling from the worst food inflation crisis and this inflation crisis is affecting some of the most underprivileged people of this country who are dependent on government rations for their livelihoods to survive in this country 800 million people are depending on government rations and this comes at a time when india is battling with erratic weather we are battling with hyperinflation in common vegetables like tomatoes and onions who are now more expensive than the price of 1 liter of petrol the indian economy and particularly the food economy is in shambles the question to ask now is if india cannot even manage its own how can we project to be leaders of the world how can we show other countries the way when perhaps our economy itself is quite feeble to discuss these matters further we have with us prominent indian economist santosh mehrotra who is going to be talking to us about the food inflation about the state of the indian economy and where is india actually headed so without wasting any time i'd like to welcome mr mehrotra to the show so welcome to the show mm-hmm. and let me begin with the food economy first a recent report which has been circulating in the indian media and also in the newspapers that in the month of august you know india has been experiencing the wor- the most driest and hottest august ever and a result of that has been dampened harvests low supply of vegetables and and other fruits and other other food commodities a direct impact of that has been that there has been a a, a hyperinflation on the thali which means the indian plate and the vegetarian diet or the vegetarian plate has increased by about 25% that's how sharp the inflation is whereas the non vegetarian plate has has inflated by a 12% a 12 to 13% so sir how do you see this where do you see food inflation heading and also keep in mind that the tomato prices and the onion prices were touching highest ever so how do you read all these signs which are coming to us well it is indeed a sad state of affairs because this is not inevitable because some some of it is uh, caused by climate change but we can prepare for climate change and unfortunately we we are not preparing for climate change and some of it is just caused by bad economic policy management uh, and so so we can discuss each one of those let's discuss the the climate change consider, uh, concerns uh because those are overwhelming and they have become been becoming worse for india and i think a new story recently pointed out that uh 
developing countries are among the most affected by climate change and of course agriculture dependent economies like ours uh where you know still at this juncture 45% of our total workforce is dependent upon agriculture uh india in particular is particularly prone uh to to uh rainfall deficits because we are <laughs> our uh, agriculture is such that it is rainfall dependent still 75 years after independence we haven't managed to solve that problem meaning that only about 45 to 50% of the total agricultural land cultivable land is under irrigation and that irrigation itself is is very inefficient we are subject we'll come back to because that's a policy related flaw uh it's not climate change related and the remaining half more than half is is rain fed which is semi arid which is the most of the southern part of the country which is peninsula the peninsula now given this foundational fact when your rainfall becomes erratic with you know episodes of very high and with the other other at other times episodes of very low rain then it throws out of gear the farmer's uh, cycle uh, the the sowing cycle the harvesting cycle which we've been seeing season after season now clearly policy should have reacted to this impending climate change if, uh, effect by ensuring much better usage of water which is very very badly managed and you know that bad management has not changed hardly changed at all in the last 10 to 15 years when the intense when the effects of climate change have intensified and at the same time more investment public investment into agriculture the tragedy is that the government faces a silent fiscal crisis and therefore it is it has pulled back from public investment in agriculture and we are paying for you know our farmers are paying the price for this and our consumers are paying the price for this because had that investment into irrigation and of much more cost effective irrigation you know focusing particularly on on uh, reducing water usage in uh, areas like punjab and in maharashtra maharashtra for for sugarcane punjab for rice had had the had policies been designed to shift farmers out of the these uh, water intensive water guzzling crops in those areas and transferring these crops to to production in other areas then we would have gotten we wouldn't necessarily have gotten to this situation uh, the second thing is that we should have ideally been using to a much greater extent in an israel like fashion drip irrigation and spray irrigation and we don't do, do that i mean we continue with our farming methods which have been followed for the last 50 years you know as part of our green revolution uh te technology adoption you know we are in a different phase of of climate change altogether there was pr practically no evidence of climate change 50 years ago when the first when the green revolution started now the green revolution has gone everywhere you know rice is being grown in different parts of the country and you know whether it's being grown in the appropriate places or not remain remains a open question you know farmers will take up uh rice farming uh, if irrigation was avail is available just because there is a minimum support price available from the state government now that's a real problem because that means that our pricing policy is actually encouraging wrong uh, uh crop, crops being introduced and being for, being uh, grown in areas which are which are drought prone so clearly uh you know there is been a, a a compounding of effects coming from on the one hand climate change and on the other hand poor planning and poor policy and you know great conflict between the center and the states 
because although land and water are ultimately they belong to the remit of state governments you know there are issues which are of a cross border cross state nature which have to be handled with great care either between the states or with the intervention of the central government now because center state relations have only been on a deteriorating path over the last 5 or 6 years you know thanks to the bad bad blood being created uh unfortunately by the bad behavior of the central government on account of the gst gst compensation we are in a situation where you know issues completely unconnected to gst are getting affected so you can see now what let me back up a little bit and and take this back as to where the foundational problem lies you see unless and until we uh at the central level in other words state, state and center taken together decide that this requires a whole of nation approach meaning center has to act in on cons concert with the states wherever the problems are arising i mean i'm talking particularly which are uh, problems of a climate change nature uh and 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 and, and we cannot allow this to situation to fester because as you rightly pointed out in your introduction inflation is flying you know it's just taken off and it shows no signs of of uh, becoming tepid now if if we continue to push under the carpet all these issues and then we will have a continuation of this problem now let however i mean having discuss these agroclimatic issues for a while now let me just go back to the more immediate inflation of food inflation issues because there is one thing that the government can do straight away which is reduce prices or of petrol and diesel if they did that and that's in the hands of the government because it could just reduce the taxes that it is collecting it is causing general inflation and it is causing food inflation in particular because food in a large country like ours has to be transported and transport costs are factored in to the final price so for instance let's just take the case of rice or even any of the other vegetables that you were you were mentioning you see inevitably there are certain parts of the country where there is a surplus of these products because you know the agroclimatic zone is appropriate for growing those pro for those those produce there and so they, therefore per, inevitably those that produce has to be transported to other parts of the country the simple example is that of you know rice and wheat mm -hmm. where you know there are a few states where which are growing much more rice after the spread of the green revolution but the fact of the matter is the vast majority of the states are actually supplied their rice or wheat from the, under the pds by you know western up uh, uh, punjab and haryana and mm -hmm. you know i guess um, what it, what's it's called madhya pradesh feeds itself and i think it has a it has a bit of a surplus but you can imagine how these northern states then have to supply the rest of the country transportation costs become very important now if the center was to reduce its taxes on petrol and diesel it would immediately bring inflation rates down now you see the results of covid were that millions of people lost jobs and jobs have not revived the economy might have so, so called revived revived because of the organized sector has revived but the unorganized sector has not revived if the unorganized sector has not revived jobs have not revived that means wages are low right first people have lost jobs second you know wages are low when you know there are too many surplus workers around mm -hmm. and not few not enough jobs therefore their incomes have fallen at the same time the government's not addressing you know taking the bull by the horns uh, by handling food inflation you know the two dimensions the agroclimatic dimensions of, of of food inflation and also the policy there if the government doesn't do that then inevitably people are going to suffer you know and and people are suffering there is just no question about it it is already beginning to show 
in the you know voting pattern of 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 our of our electorate sorry so i'm going to just jump in there and because you've raised the topic of the economy i'm going to refer to you know this this new article by mr modi ashok modi from princeton which has been doing the rounds and and i know you've already said this last year also and maybe the year before and some of the other indian people have also said this out like hey we are not uh achieving the the growth targets that we are telling the world we are we are achieving you know the gdp growth is not 7% we are we are much below that what is your comment that now this recent article with surfaces from princeton and he said that well in the first quarter we india has not managed to get uh, the the projected growth in fact we are maybe between 3.5 to 4% at best so what what would you say to that and especially given that g20 is happening right now and we are telling the world that we want to be vishwa gurus or world leaders and here we are maybe faking our growth estimates is because that's what the article said this is not what i'm saying but that's what the article said any comments on that yes indeed i mean some of us have already been saying precisely what uh, professor ashok modi has said you know uh, and uh, i'm glad that some journalists are taking note of this uh, the government is still not going to take note because it is trying to push an agenda on a narrative that you know we are we are the fastest growing large economy in the world the when the reality may well be otherwise for the following reasons let me explain because this is slightly technical and and, and somewhat complicated however uh, let me make it as about as simple as as, po as possible you see the the first important pro problem is uh, and this is the um this is the reason why the growth rate seems high but in fact is is low is the following after demonetization there was a slowdown in the unorganized sector and in the msme sector now this slowdown and destruction of production capacity in the unorganized sector is relevant to the estimation of gdp and its growth in the following way because india is a highly informalized economy with a very high proportion 70% of our 66 million enterprises in the non farm sector are unregistered anywhere so in every sector there is there is both a organized and registered sector and then there is an unorganized and unregistered sector let's take the example of let's say textiles how does the central statistical organizations located in in ministry of statistics estimate the gross value added in the textile sector it does the following it looks at it looks at the organized sector of farms uh, because they send in their their data and they use the organized sector growth rates relative to last year and project it onto the unorganized sector because we don't have hard data for the for most of the unorganized sector units therefore they use it to project it we have some data for some parts of the unorganized sector let's say in the textiles and the same story will apply to other sectors mm -hmm. uh so they use it to interpolate you know and from that they they arrive at a gva a gross value added for the textile sector which then gets added to the gdp mm -hmm. now i am say uh, you know we all know that post demonetization when the uh, unorganized sector in particular suffered uh and and uh post gst it suffered more and then in, during covid lockdown national lockdown unnecessarily so uh they suffered even more how many of them revived how many did not we don't really know the government knows but it's not revealing because the government knows through its economic census anyway bottom line is there is a misestimation being done in the cso on account of this project projection from the organized sector growth to the unorganized sector because in the recovery phase post covid there the, the organized sector has has recovered the unorganized sector is still not showing much much recovery had it been showing recovery jobs would have grown jobs data is collected is made public but we know that the you know non farm jobs have not been growing so this is the situation 
This is one very important reason why Modi's argument is correct. There are others. You see. You mean Ashok Modi? By the way, I'll just I'll just tell for the viewers. It's Ashok not, Modi. Yeah, Ashok. it's Ashok Modi that he's referring. Professor to. Ashok Modi of Princeton. And by the way, he is he's not the only one who's been saying this. You know, Dr. Arvind Subramaniam, the former chief economic advisor under the, the finance ministry for four years ago, was saying this. I've been saying this. Professor Arun Kumar, my col my ex colleague in JNU, has been saying this. We've been saying this publicly. Uh, I'm glad that people are listening. Anyway, the other problems, there are two or three other problems which people need to understand. One is that in any case, our estimation of GDP for e every quarter is a projection, is based on a projection. How solid is a pro can a projection be? It's part based on a projection, part based on, on solid facts. Mm -hmm. Pro problem number two. Problem number three. In any case, because we have a highly informalized economy, it takes time for all data co to come together. You know, there are four estimates over a spread over a period of two years before the GDP of a particular uh, year is finalized mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the CSO itself doesn't know. Let me explain. In January of every year, just before the budget is to be presented, the Ministry of Finance asks the CSO to give an estimate for the financial year up to March of that year. Mm -hmm. please, uh, please note that this is being done in January. That means one quarter data is not, not even there. Mm -hmm. So they are using projections for that one quarter. That's the first advanced estimate. That's the basis on which a, the budget is prepared and the growth rates for the following financial year and the budget allocations for the fi following financial year are announced on 1st February of that particular year. So you can see how weak the basis is of those numbers. Mm -hmm. Next, the next actual estimate which is called the second advanced estimate, comes after the financial year is over at the end of March. It comes around May. That is still only the second. Mm -hmm. Later in the year, you get what is called the provisional estimate because you get better data from all the units, farm and non-farm, across the country by the end of the calendar year. Mm -hmm. And then... One year after that, in other words, nearly two years after the financial year is over, you get the actual estimate because only then have the final estimate. So can you imagine how growth projections for a quarter, I mean growth estimates for a quarter, which are sort of debated so much on, on in the Noida media, the Darbari media, have how much meaning they have? You get the point. Yes. And final thing I would say here is that, and I've sort of hinted at this already, thanks to the shocks that were delivered by poor economic policy and bad, bad economic management, you got severe damage to the, to the unorganized sector of economy. A segment of the economy from 2016 onwards. Mm -hmm. The landmark events I've already mentioned. We are in the recovery phase in the last one year or so. From the contraction of the economy in FY 2021 by 6.6%, 6 .6%, which in any case was worse by two and a half times compared to the global economy contraction of 3.1%. Mm -hmm. You get in 21-22 a, a bounce back, obviously from a low base, and then a, a, a further recovery to uh, in 22-23, the financial year that is just over. And that's obviously you're getting, a, you're counting from a low base, so you're getting the a, a fast uh, bounce back. And so we 
you know, the government pa starts patting itself on the back by saying, we are the fastest growing large economy in the world. Are Baba, you contracted more th than the rest of the world also. So don't forget that. Anyway, bottom line, when the recovery took place, we also know the jobs were not growing much. Mm -hmm. They grew only in the organized sector. So what are we saying? We've had a K-shaped recovery. In other words, the organized sector is gaining at the expense of the unorganized sector. Mm -hmm. And which is the foundational reason that you are saying distress at the for the bottom half of the population, compounded by climate change factors that we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the rich are doing nice, nicely or the upper class is doing nicely. Thank you very much. And, and the corporates, the listed corporates in, in any case are, are laughing their way to the bank because corporate profits for the last two years have been the highest in the last two in the last eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, so much so that uh, they also got a windfall from the corporate tax re re reduction of 2019. Huh? When they got when they did that, then they massively de uh, deleveraged. In other words, they re returned a lot of the loans that they had taken. So they are really sitting pretty, and yet they are not investing. The corporate tax rates was reduced. They are not increasing investment. Investment as a proportion of GDP, Mr. Singh, are still at twenty nine percent in FY twenty three. When this this while this government had inherited a uh, investment to GDP ratio in 13-14 of 31%. It has never been 31% in the last 13 years, which is the reason why our economy is not growing, which is the reason jobs are not growing, and which is one reason why, you know, demand is low and it, uh, not just because of inflation and food inflation. Mm -hmm. People just don't have the money. Ordinary yeah. people. Ordinary yeah, I agree. People. And in fact, um, I'll just add a little bit more here. Like there is the, the, the work demand on the Meg Nerega, which is the rural work scheme. There has been an additional pressure of 20% just in the month of August. So Correct. everything that you're saying is backed by, by the government data itself. Although the Correct. data is very vague and people are trying to hide it, but still there are clear signs and symptoms that Absolutely. the economy is not doing well. The rural economy is not doing well. And that right. gets me to my second question, like my third question, which is, you know, history has a very strange way of repeating itself. And you've been an expert. You've had your major thesis on Russia. And, and I know we, we, we done a back and forth on this, but the current situation in India, the way it is happening, hyperinflation, projected numbers, everything that you've said, where, which world event or which situation does it remember or resemble from the past? I'm not saying it's exactly ditto, but if we, if you were to say that, well, this has happened before somewhere in the world, where would that be? This is serious enough, in some ways worse than the mid 60s of in India itself, because there we had three years of drought. We had just come out of a war, and here we are coming out of a of a of a um, global pandemic. We had high food inflation. We've got massive joblessness. And the population now is three times what it was in the 60s. Please try and appreciate the change in the magnitude of the problem. And at that time, this I'm saying this is worse than the 60s because you had practically no evidence of climate change then. You but now have... I'll just jump in just and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but but just the, the point about the richer class getting fatter, you know, the wealthy class eating off the bottom and getting fatter, which which naturally signals to me and, and the people hearing you of, of an oligarchy, which is which is which is profiting from the government funds, which is profiting from the things and I don't need to name them. Everyone knows who they are. I so can give you I, a, I, I understand what you mean. I can give you a, another international comparison, possibly Brazil. Because it's a large country. Russia is also a large country. However, I'll make us, I'll still make another distinction. You know, each country's problems are really quite unique. Mm -hmm. Let me explain what I mean. Yeah. Brazil's population today is, believe it or not, barely, uh, it's actually smaller than the size of uh, UP, UP's population in a much in a country which is bigger than India. Okay, this is, 
Bear with me for a second. I need to. Now, and secondly, they are at a much higher level of per capita income. They are nearly a, a high income country. Their per capita income is 11,000 USD. We are at 2,500 USD. So we have a much worse situation in a, in a worse agroclimatic, uh, sorry, in a, in a worse uh, climate change situation. So, you know, I, I, there are very few parallels. So it's very difficult to draw comparisons because we are still a very poor country. We may pretend otherwise. So what if we are the fifth largest economy in the world? We also have the largest population of the world. Our per capita income makes us the poorest country among the G20. Now, of course, because the African Union has become a, a member where the vast majority are, you know, poorer than us, we can pretend, oh, we are not that bad. But even they, you know, the vast majority, I mean, the whole population of Africa is 1.4 billion people. We are, we are also 1.4 billion people. Please try and understand the scale yeah. of the Enormity. problem. Africa is four, probably four or five times bigger than India's geography, geographically. So, you know, nothing is comparable to any, any other. It's very difficult to draw these, these comparisons. I mean, which is, the, which is why, you know, we have to really begin to understand the complexity of our problems and we, and we have to have a planning approach. Because these problems are far too grave and the impending crisis could be even worse. What's coming could be even worse. I don't think we are recognizing the possibility of slow growth, 5 to 6% and joblessness growing and climate events happening in this context. Now, imagine... All decisions being take, continue to be taken in the Prime Minister's office. Well, the Prime Minister's office is not the oracle of all knowledge and all that's wise. You know, you need very, very seasoned minds and very experienced minds, very experienced minds in order to address these problems. Uh, and we don't have a planning commission. We've done away with it. So we are in the worst of all worlds. I want to tell, I want to emphasize this point because we are the only con Asian country, the only Asian country which doesn't have a, a planning planning commission equivalent body. Mm -hmm. Because we've done away with it seven, eight years ago. And these are problems which are so serious. They long, they require a long term vision. Not just big talk about international solar alliance. You know, that's not going to solve our problems of, of uh, you know, the water crisis, let alone it solving the pro problem of, of, of uh, energy. So, so I think this come, brings me to my last question. And I think you spoke about it a little bit already. What is the crisis that we are looking at? Like, I'm, you're not an astrologist. I understand that. And I'm not asking you to make any future predictions. But whatever you see as an economist, from hyperinflation to joblessness to the dismantling of, of the informal economy. What do you see or happening in the next coming years? Maybe in the next couple of years, next year is also election year. Are we going to get the fruit of our actions in the, in the coming years? Well, unfortunately, we are not taking enough action to get the fruits. So, unfortunately... I'm actually foreseeing the worst. Let me explain why. Because in an environment where over the course of the next year, all decision making in the government, economic decision making will be politically determined whether this is going to win us votes or not going to win us votes. And am I going to come to power or not come back to power in this state or that state or in the, or in the Lok Sabha? Because of this, these long-term vision issues will not be addressed and the immediate issues will be addressed by oh we will reduce the petrol and diesel taxes 
by you know five percent or ten percent and reduce try and reduce inflation using that you know a few weeks before the elections but that's not going to solve the problem because there are structural problems mm -hmm. you see, unless you ad understand recognize and then address in a systematic way in a planned approach in a long term way these agroclimatic issues which are directly connected to planning for agriculture and work and moving workers out of agriculture because there's too much dependence of our workers on agriculture because of the policies of this government you've had an increase of dependence on agriculture of workers there were reverse migration led to 60 million people going back to being dependent on agriculture when between 2004 and 19 at least workers were leaving agriculture now 60 million people have gone back to agriculture so 45 percent of our worker at one point three years ago in 2019 42 percent were dependent upon and now 45 percent are dependent upon more than 45 are dependent upon agriculture this is a ridiculous situation when you need to pull workers out of agriculture thereby you know improve productivity in agriculture increase incomes in agriculture you are doing the opposite people have not come out from agriculture i'm talking about the latest data mm -hmm. so we are in a catastrophic situation my friend And would you like to just tersely like tell us a little bit more about this catastrophic situation? Like, are we seeing a meltdown of the economy? Are we seeing an an imminent no. economic crisis? No, we're not about to see a meltdown because we we are muddling through every problem. Mm -hmm. We will continue to muddle through at least for the next year, un unless and until we get a change of government, because this government has shown no vision at all. It has brought us to this crisis. It's, I think what I've demonstrated in this interview to you is the very poor economic policy management and the very poor understanding of the, of the climate change issue and how it's affecting uh, our entire economy. Because you see, it claims that it's inflation, it has controlled inflation. Well, this was true for about seven or eight years, but that was only because it got a windfall gain from international oil prices having fallen from their 2014 level of $120 mm -hmm. to $50 for most of seven of the nine and a half years that this government has been in power, it has had a windfall gain on account of that. That's why it's been able to spend, you know, spend freely on the freebies that it has been spreading around. However, for the last two and a half years, first international prices went up and even after they came down, it has tried to continue to pay for its freebies by borrowing more and by keeping you know indirect taxes high particularly on, di on diesel and gas because it's also reduced corporate taxes so its borrowing has gone from 55 lakh crores in two, in two, 2014 to 155 lakh crores i mean in in a in a semi, so, so 65 year period we had our borrowings the same, the nation's borrowings the government's borrowings stood at 55 lakh crores in 14. Mm -hmm. In nine years, they've tripled it to 155 lakh crores. Why? Because of these e poor economic policies. So I'm sorry to say that these problems will... Thankfully, this borrowing is not international, which is why we are not like Argentina. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, this borrowing is not international. That's why we are not like Angola or Congo or someone. But we pretend to sit on the high table, na? Without the economy to go back to back it up. I mean, let's just remember that in 1995, China's per capita income was the same as ours. In 28 years since then, they are five and a half times bigger than us. Of these 28 years, 18 years, the NDA has been in power. I see. No, thank you very much. Thank you for, for your time and for your, for your comments, Mr. Malhotra. It's been a lovely time talking with you. And viewers, if you have any comments on this, you know, about the state of the economy, there are some symptoms that you think that you are experiencing. Don't forget to comment on our YouTube channel or tweet on our Twitter page. And 
don't go away from the wire the wire will be bringing to you more shows so thank you very much for joining us